Good morning, young humans of Owsley Junior High School. This is Mr. Hill, the Michigan State Texas history teacher, coming at you again from uh, history world stuff. And the other day, um, you learned about the Mexican War. Um, and we talked about the effects of the Mexican War a little bit. Um, we talked about the results. We talked about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. We talked about um, the uh, Mexican Cession. And we talked a little bit about the Compromise of 1850. But today, we're going to backtrack just a little bit, and we are going to talk about the effects of the war, uh, the effects of the Mexican War. And uh, we're going to deep dive into the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo just a little bit uh, more, because a lot of the stuff in that, is, is very important to understanding, um, uh, honestly, not only Texas today, but understanding a little bit about Mexico. So um, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> uh, the, we're going to talk about the effects of the war, or the effects the war had for the United States, and then we're going to talk about the effects of the war on Mexico. And, uh, and then at the end, we're going to kind of do a little uh, point of view activity, um, and but we'll, but we'll get to that. So, for the effects of the war on the United States, the Mexican-American War was the first war fought almost entirely on foreign soil. All other wars that the United States had been involved in up to this point had been on U.S. soil. This is the first time that the United States Army had been an invading force on another country's soil. So this was a pretty big deal. Uh, all of our other wars had been wars of defense, where we were fighting off someone who was here on our land. Now, the, another effect of the war was that it expanded U.S. military capabilities. Um, we, in the Mexican-American War, the U.S. Army had multiple armies that were fighting in Mexico. Now, it was one U.S. Army, but you had different groups of the Army under different generals who were uh, given different orders, like uh, Winfield Scott was ordered to take a force of, of uh, soldiers and Marines uh, and, and do an amphibious landing uh, in Veracruz along the eastern coast of Mexico. Uh, and, and then there were other, Zachary Taylor's army uh, was based here in Texas, and they uh, forced their way down through northern Mexico. So you had more than one army uh, within the United States uh, military that was working their way into Mexico. Uh, you had an amphibious assault, which is the first time that the United States Army had ever been involved in an assault where soldiers on ships landed on the beach and, and attacked. Um, you had long supply lines. Supply lines means when you have soldiers that are deep in enemy territory, you need to have a way to get them supplies. So you have to set up and maintain these lines to get supplies like food and ammunition and, and the medical needs, things that they needed. And then also the U.S. Um, occupied for a short time the capital of Mexico, uh, Mexico City. Um, the cost of human life for the U.S. was about 13,000 troops. We talked about that the other day. Whoops. Uh, the war cost the United States government about $100 million. Now, that's a lot of money today. At the time, that was an astronomical figure, uh, a figure that people could barely even comprehend, $100 million. Uh, another effect of the war is that at the end of the war, uh, when we gained the Mexican session, it brought gold and silver from California and Nevada which helped the U.S. economy. Also, probably the biggest effect of the war that it had on the U.S. is that it gave us the Pacific Ocean, gave us the Pacific Coast. And it made the United States a world power because now the U.S. had seaports on both the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Okay, We were a, we were a transcontinental nation from one side of the, the 
continent to the other. Now, the effects that the war had on Mexico were obviously quite different and very dramatic. There were over 25,000 battle-related deaths, and as I told my class, that number of 25,000-plus battle-related deaths, that is nowhere near what the number of deaths that were caused by the war because of, of uh, non-combatant uh, casualties, uh, people who were killed, uh, who weren't even in the, the battles. Um, you had uh, famine and disease that resulted from uh, from the war going on. Uh, and then for years after that, the, the problems that um, were brought about by the war um, on the economy and everything else, just it resulted in, in just a tremendous loss of life in Mexico. Uh, because of the war, there were now thousands of orphans, widows, and cripples in Mexico, uh, people who had lost their fathers, their husbands, uh, and, and then, of course, soldiers who had been severely injured who could no longer work and participate in um, in you know, economic activity there in Mexico because they, they could no longer work. Um, there was also extensive destruction to cities throughout Mexico. Uh, when battles would take place in a city, uh, buildings would be destroyed, the infrastructure would be destroyed, um, and it became, um, that became a long-lasting effect of the war in Mexico. There was a steep decline in agriculture because of lack of farmers and workers. So many uh, deaths had occurred during the war that it severely hurt Mexico's ability to uh, grow crops and raise livestock to feed its people. There was political instability in Mexico because at the end of the war, the United States had occupied um, Mexico and uh, it caused a lot of... Uh, problems in the Mexican government, a lot of confusion as to who was in charge. Um, this led to a, uh, a dictator uh, like Santa Ana once again, uh, a person who has total power in the government, making all the decisions, um, taking over the government, and, and it led to the people rising up against this dictator, uh, and it led to a civil war. So the instability that, that was resulted from the war in Mexico um, was very damaging, uh, for, to be honest, for nearly the next 180 years. Um, there was also a shattered sense of national honor and dignity. Uh, after the Mexican War, the Mexican government, the people of Mexico felt humiliated because an invading army had come in, had taken over their land, and at the end of it, Mexico had been forced to sign a treaty that took away nearly half of, of the, the lands of Mexico. So it, it, really, it really did a number on their, on their minds and, and, and on their spirit, um, one that, that, you know, was still being felt, you know, 100, 100 plus years later. Now, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. What did the treaty do? Well, we talked about this the other day. Uh, it ended the Mexican War. Mexico recognized Texas as part of the U.S. They no longer believed that Texas was still part of Mexico. Uh, Mexico accepted that the Rio Grande was the border between the United States and Mexico. And it gave the United States the Mexican cession. Mexico ceded, or gave away about 55% of its territory to the United States in exchange for $15 million. Now, as I told my class, that was, that giving up that amount of land for $15 million would be like going out and getting in your car and finding that someone had stolen your stereo, uh, but they had left a $10 bill laying on the dashboard to pay for it. Um, they had taken something that wasn't theirs, and in exchange, they gave back a pittance of a uh, of a compensation. Uh, that fifteen million dollars didn't come close to covering um, the loss that Mexico experienced over that land. And of course, here's the map. This is the lands that the United States received in exchange for Mexico signing the 
Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and then receiving the 15 million, the United States got what would eventually become California, Nevada, Utah, part of Arizona, part of New Mexico, part of Colorado, and a small portion of Wyoming. So what else did the treaty do? Well, this is where it gets to be a little, this is, this is the important part. I mean, the other part's important, don't get me wrong, but this is the part that, that, that we get to see um, a problem in our, here in the United States that, that's been a problem for many years, and, and in some respects it's still a problem. When the war was over and the treaty was signed, um, the Mexican citizens who were living in that area of the Mexican session, you know, California, Arizona, Nevada, all those areas, those citizens were given a choice. They were told, you can either stay where you're at and become U.S. citizens, or you can just pack up your stuff and you can leave and go, go to Mexico. Uh, and if they did that, they were giving up their land. They weren't, you know, they pretty much weren't able to sell their land for the value of it uh, because anybody knowing that they were, that, that anybody that wanted to buy the land that knew that these people were going back to Mexico or were going to Mexico, um, they were going to get the money for, or get the land for, for half the value, if even that. Um, and, and in reality, too, if you think about it, these are people who had lived on this land or who may have lived on this land for a hundred years. Their, their families had owned the land and they had a choice, either become U.S. citizens or, or go move to Mexico, which is a place that they probably had never even been down into, you know, the New Mexico, the, the Mexico that existed after their land got taken away. So most of the people who were in the U.S. who had been Mexican citizens uh, became U.S. citizens. Now, they were told that they would be uh, that the treaty also protected their property and their civil rights. So the treaty protected property and civil rights of Mexican nationals who had been living on that land that made up the Mexican session. So, in essence, what they were told is, you're giving up your Mexican citizenship. You're going to become a U.S. citizen. And you're going to have all the rights and privileges that all other U.S. citizens have. Now, is that the way it worked out? Not really. Because when the treaty was sent to Washington after it had been signed, and it had to be ratified or approved by the U.S. Congress, the U.S. Senate ratified the treaty in March, but it deleted Article 10, which guaranteed the protection of Mexican land ownership. So in other words, uh, some of these people who had been living on that land for, you know, their families had owned it for 100 plus years, if they didn't have some sort of deed of ownership, then they could conceivably be forced off their land, and, and it did happen. Um, it became a uh, unfortunate side effect of the treaty that um, a lot of uh, Mexican people who became U.S. citizens um, had their land uh, swindled from them, had it taken away, were cheated out of it, uh, or, or in some cases basically had it outright stolen out from under them. So uh, a very sad effect of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some differing points of view. And I told you that um, um, we were going to work on a little assignment that deals with point of view uh, at the end. So uh, we're going to look at both the Mexican point of view and the American point of view. So first, according to the Mexican point of view at the beginning of the war, the Nueces River was the boundary between Texas and Mexico. In the United States point of view, the boundary was the Rio Grande. So the Mexican point of view was the Nueces was the boundary. The American point of view, the Rio Grande was the boundary. The Mexican point of view on the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was that they resented it. Of course, they obviously did not like it. it their land had been taken away. They uh, were told that they had to be U.S. citizens or they had to move to Mexico. The U.S. 
liked the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. They justified the treaty because it allowed the United States to achieve manifest destiny, that belief that they had the right and privilege to expand the Pacific Ocean. Now, the Mexican Cession. Mexico obviously resented the Mexican Cession because it took half of their land. The U.S. was happy with the Mexican Cession because it allowed the U.S. to expand the Pacific Ocean once again. Manifest destiny. Also, Mexico did not like the fact that Mexican citizens in the lands that made up the session had to either become U.S. citizens or give up their land and move to Mexico. U.S. citizens loved this. When Congress chose to not honor Mexican land grants, U.S. citizens moved into these new territories and tried to claim land that had been owned by these Mexican citizens before the, the war and before the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So, here's our activity. Um, if you're watching this on Wednesday, then you are not going to see this activity, at least in my class, until Thursday. Um, there is going to be a, um, um, a Google Doc. Now, it, it, here it's titled Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo Talking Heads. That's the old name for it. Uh, I believe now it's called Effects of the Mexican War and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo POV. So you're going to see two pages, uh, one for Mexico's point of view, one for the U.S. point of view. Uh, read the instructions on the activity, and then you are going to write how each side, how Mexico might have felt and how the U.S. might have felt, about these five topics. The Rio Grande is the border between Texas and Mexico, Manifest Destiny, the Mexican Cession, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and the most significant impact of the Mexican War for each country, and then explain why you believed it was the most significant impact. So that's gonna be your activity. Um, if you have any questions, make sure to ask your teacher, and um, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this. hope you learned a little something, and until next time, we'll, uh, uh, I guess we'll, uh, what do you say, talk to you later?